Good morning. It's still a good morning. Um, today I want to kind of reprise a message that I, I started a couple weeks ago and didn't feel like I gave it the attention that it needed. Um, if you pay any attention at all to the news, you know that there's a lot going on in Israel. Um, I, I confess I grew up in a church uh, that was a replacement theology church. Uh, for those of you that don't know, replacement theology is the idea, the theology that God has forsaken Israel and taking all of the blessings that he had promised them and he now pours them out on the Christians. And the Jews have no place. Okay? Um, this is actually a view that was espoused actually only a couple hundred years after Christ's resurrection and ascension. Um, I'm going to move this. Um... So a couple weeks ago, I, I did a subject on, you know, so what's up with Israel? And I, I talked a little bit about how God had called Israel, how God had established Israel. And it, it was kind of funny because I read an article last night, and, and it was, as I was reading the article, there were a couple conversations going on, so I wasn't really focusing on the article. Uh, but the article had a, a really good point that I have contended uh, for years with, um, people always use the scripture um, specifically in America, oftentimes around the 4th of July. Uh, in Second Chronicles, I believe it's chapter 7, says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will hear their land. Okay? And a lot of times I hear people pray that over America. Now, while I believe that Scripture generally reveals the heart of God, specifically, that is for the nation of Israel at a specific time and event in their history. It's not for America. It's not like America is all of a sudden going to throw themselves on the ground before God and confess their sins and turn away from their sins, and God's going to bless their land. Now, I believe in a general sense, Scripture tells us that when a people honor God, they are blessed. Okay? There are Scriptures that support that. But that particular passage, I believe, is specifically for Israel. Now, Israel, the, does anybody know what Israel means? The name Israel? What's it? What? Contends with God. Or contends, with God. contends with God. Now, if you remember your Old Testament, uh, Jacob went to sleep, and in the night he wrestled with God, and uh, says the angel of the Lord. We believe that is pre-incarnate Christ. And when the sun rose, the angel said, "Okay, the sun's coming up. Release me." And Jacob said, "Not till you bless me." Okay. And, and it was spoken over him that he would be called Israel from that point on. And, and Israel means contends with God. He literally wrestled with God. Okay? But God's calling of Israel precedes that by, by quite a while. And I, I'm only going to touch briefly on that because there's some things that I didn't get to last time that are important that we talk about today. Okay? First, God called... Abram, and he spoke to Abram, living in Haran, and said, pack up and go to a place I'll show you. And Abram packed up and went. Okay? One of the things that is absolutely amazing to me is that God requires faith. That He requires faith. Oftentimes, he requires ridiculous faith in order to see incredible power. 
God asks people to do things that are far beyond their means in the natural, so that when the supernatural happens, they know it's him and not them. And so he speaks to Abram and he says, get up and go. The McDaniels have made it to Oregon. God spoke to them about two years ago, get up and go. And it took a period of time for them to take care of all of their affairs, get everything settled here, and to go. We still that, see that happening today. As a matter of fact, I think if more people would listen, we would have more people getting up and going. Because the fields are white unto the harvest. Um, <clears throat> so he says, uh, go. Abram packs up, takes his wife, takes his nephew, and he goes. Okay. Now God lays out a, a, a thing before Abram, and he says, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. That's huge. Okay? Because that's the only time we see that, that dynamic at work in all of Scripture. <clears throat> Where a man is told, if people will bless you, I'm going to bless them. Just because of you. But if they curse you, I'm going to curse them because of you. Okay? So, replacement theology is one of those things that really has, has seeped in to the church, sometimes overtly, sometimes covertly, sometimes it's in your face, such as the church I grew up, where they'd read something that very clearly read Israel, and they'd go, oh, no, 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 we need to substitute the church there. Okay? God doesn't give us that permission. Okay? When, when God puts His Word down, it's permanent. He actually says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands until I find something better. <laughs> stands until you find something more convenient. Forever. It's forever. It's unchanging. Okay? Because it comes from a God who lives outside of time. He's not subject to time. So when He says something, He knows it's always going to be that way. Alright? So, God calls him. He goes... Um, he has a son named Isaac. God calls Isaac. God calls Isaac's son Jacob, who is known as Israel. He calls the patriarchs. And, and we see a nation birth. When, when God speaks to Abram, Abram at the time, he says, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as as the sands on the sea and as countless as the stars in the sky okay I don't know if any of you guys ever tried counting the stars in the sky I never wasted that much time I just thought it was cool to lay there and watch them okay um, I've never tried to count the sands on the seashore um, for those of you that have tried I'm sorry <laughs> You wasted a day. <laughs> um, so, God has established this. Now, when he called Abram and he said, I'm going to bless you, why did he call Abram? Because, see, there was, a, there was a reason for God calling Abram. There's, there's a couple things I want to explain to you. First, he didn't call Abram because Abram was great. He didn't call him because he came from a mighty people. He was, he was a, a nomad. He was a wanderer. You know, he ended up in Haran because his dad packed up from Ur of the Chaldees and headed north. And, and so um, when we think of Abram, this was a guy whose life was spent in a tent. Okay? Now, he was blessed. He had incredible wealth for that time. One of the things that was absolutely amazing to me when we were in Israel is there are still Bedouin. There's still the tents. They all have satellites attached. <laughs> it was a, the most amazing thing. You, you'd be riding down the road, and you'd look into, oh, look, there's a tent, there's the ghost, there's a the shepherd, there's a satellite. <laughs> Don't forget the big tractor. The big tractor. <laughs> and, and cell phones. Oh, my gosh. Everybody over there had them. 
Kids out there herding sheep, playing on the phone. It was amazing. Um, that's off topic, though. Um, okay, so when, when Abraham, he's, he's, a, he's a Bedouin, okay? He's, he's a nomad. And then his son, and his son, and his sons, they were all nomads. As a matter of fact, they returned to their nomadic roots when God called them out of Egypt and brought them to Israel and they messed up and, and they had to spend 40 years wandering in the desert. As a matter of fact, one of the feasts that God declared was the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tents. And the entire nation of Israel was supposed to go out of their house and live in a tent to remember that time. Okay? So my granddaughter's laughing at me. Okay. Um, but God has called them. God has appointed them. Now, we see that Israel failed God numerous times such that the ten northern tribes went into exile under Assyria. And then a short time later, the two southern tribes went into exile as well under the Babylonians. Okay? Um, so we, we get to a point, uh, they, they return, the nation is rebuilt, and we see the Greeks come in, we see the, the rise of the Hasmonean di dynasty under the Maccabees, we see the Romans come in. We see all of this is set up for the birth of Jesus so that the, the spread of the gospel could go out. Because see, one of the other conditions that God had for calling Abram was that through him, he would bless all the people of the earth. Think about that. God were to call you and say, hey, I'm going to make of you a mighty nation. And from that nation, from you, I'm going to bless all of the earth. Okay? Wow, that's cool. So, 2,000 years ago, Jesus is born, a Jew. He was not blonde. He did not have blue eyes. He was Semitic. He was a Jew. He looked like an average Jew. I don't think an average Jew like we think of in New York I think an average Jew like was over in Israel. Now, God has a special place in his heart for the Jews. He has called them his people. So we've established, if you guys have any questions about the establishment of God's call for Israel, look up the message from about three weeks ago. It's on YouTube. You can kind of see the, the scriptures that I'm, I'm pulling from and, and look at that at, at your leisure. But, but see, there's, there's some things that really cause a problem. I was reading this article about um, that passage of scripture by people who are called by my name, and I was so relieved for him to say that they are, you know, it's not for America, it's not a, a prophecy given to America. But, but one of the things is I was kind of reading through and I'm trying to listen to what's going on around me, I, I completely missed, and Christie's, I told Christie, I said, I want you to read this article, it's pretty good. Well, I didn't read all the way through, I just read the first part of it and then handed it over to her, and she said, well, I thought it was really good, except for the replacement theology. I went, what? And then she started reading the parts I had skipped, and it was like, oh, this, this is not for America, it's for the church. Oh, because see, I was going to bring that article today for you to read. I didn't. Okay? So if you read that article, don't read that article. But, in one of the problems with the replacement theology is in the book of Romans. Because Paul writes in the book of Romans, uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 11 if you would. I'm, I'm going to back up into um, we're going to go way back to chapter 9. 9, 10, and 11 are the problematic chapters in the New Testament for replacement theology. Okay? So I'm going to start way back here in, in chapter uh, or chapter 9. Uh, verse 25 Paul is writing. He says, 
And indeed, he says, who is he? God, verse 22 says, God. Uh, even uh, as indeed he says, God says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there, shall, there they will be called the sons of the living God. As Isaiah calls out concerning Israel, uh, though the number of the sons of, of Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as I, Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a righteous uh, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. Okay? So hold that thought for just a second. Okay? Because see, this is where some of the confusion from replacement theology comes in, in that, okay, the, the Jews trying to fulfill the law have not received salvation, but the Gentiles who didn't even have the law have received it. Why? Because of faith. Now, jumping ahead, I'm going to jump all the way to uh, verse 25 in verse or chapter 11. So flip over. When you have a chance, read chapters 9, 10, and 11. Okay, so you get the whole thought in context. Okay? If you have a, an audio Bible, listen to it. A lot of times when I listen to it, I pick up things that I miss by reading. Okay? Or, or there's a different inflection, a different emphasis on a part that I hadn't put emphasis on my own. So there's, there's a lot of help in hearing it, not just reading it. Okay? Um, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay? So I want you to write that verse down. Alright? This is significant. This is important. I so often hear this verse used out of context. Okay? Um, verse 29, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. They cannot be taken back. Okay? What Paul is saying here is that when God chose Israel, He chose them forever. And Israel does not have the option of throwing that away. Now, this leads us into predestination. I said it. Okay? We're not going to get into the predestination conflict. Okay? Because there really is no conflict. There really isn't. God is absolutely sovereign. And God will do as God chooses. I believe adamantly that God chose to allow us to choose. Now, in this, this passage, God has called Israel. We see in the Old Testament that they are His people. We see other people in other nations also serve God. We see people in the nation of Israel that did not serve God. But his calling is irrevocable. It is without repentance. There's no turning back. When God brought the Israelites into the promised land, they brought them into Canaan, and at the end of Joshua's life, Joshua is laying out before them their choice. And he says, you know, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. 
whether it be the God of the Amorites in whose land you are now living, or the God of your forefathers across the sea. That's the Egyptian gods. And he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's actually an excellent passage for Father's Day, isn't it? Because he is speaking on behalf of his entire household. My house will serve God. Okay? Even though Joshua knew that God had chosen Israel and had seen miraculous things done by God on behalf of Israel, he is saying, choose whom you will serve. You are the people of God. He has called you and there's no, redeem, there's no taking that back. But you have to choose to serve him. Okay, so here we're back here. He says the gift and the calling are irrevocable. Now, when I was uh, speaking a couple weeks ago, I made mention of the fact that there is a genetic difference. There is a difference in the makeup of the Jews that is just unique among all the world. Now, everybody's unique. The, the Germans are unique from the Italians. The Italians are unique from the Chinese. The Chinese are unique from the Eskimos. Okay? They're all different. But there's a marker that is in the Jews, and they're actually using it today to find the Jews that have been dispersed throughout the world. Okay? As a matter of fact, they have found a, a tribe, I believe it's in... No, I might be wrong. I, I, I think it's Uganda. Is that right? Oh, I know no. it's in that area. I thought it was Ethiopia. Ethiopia. That's, that's probably more accurate. Okay. There is a tribe in Ethiopia that they have found that has insisted for years, for generations, that they are Jewish. They're black. They're not olive. They're black. They have been able to identify genetically that those people came from Jewish stock. And those people are now being invited home to come back to the land of Canaan, the, the land that God promised them. Now, I want to just share um, a couple things here. 1948. Good year. It was a very good year, especially for Israel. May 14th, 1948. People that say God has forsaken Israel have got to explain this day. Because I can see no less than 10 Old Testament scriptures fulfilled just in that day. I'm going to give them to you. So you write them down, you can look them up at your own time. Ready? And if you don't get them all down, come see me afterwards, I'll give them to you. Amos, chapter 9, verses 14 through 15, prophesies that Jacob's descend, descendants would regain control of Israel. Okay? Ezekiel 37, 10 through 14, Israel would be brought back to life as a nation. Isaiah 66, 7 through 8, Israel would be born, would be reborn, in one day. Ezekiel 37, 21 through 22. Israel would be reestablished as a united nation. Keep in mind, before the exile, they were two nations. Israel, or Ephraim in the north, and Judah in the south. When they were reestablished as a nation in 1948, the entire thing was brought back as the nation of Israel. Um, Jeremiah 16, 14 through 15, the second Israel would be more impressive than the first Israel. Ezekiel 4, 3 through 6. Now this is one that you guys can do the math on. I did the math and it looks right to me. I might be wrong. Uh, biblical scholar Grant Jeffrey says, Ezekiel 4, 3 through 6. This is when God speaks to Ezekiel and he says, I want you to lay on your side for so many days. And then I want you to flip over and lay on your other side for so many days. Okay? The, the total amount is 430. Alright? Now, bear with me for a minute because here's math. Alright? 
Um, Grant Jeffrey says that when God spoke to Israel that the, the time of their punishment was going to be 430 years, they went into exile, and yet after 70 years, another prophecy, Cyrus released them to go home, to return to Israel. They were allowed to rebuild Jerusalem. They were allowed to rebuild the temple. But, but at that 70 years, it was a very small minority of them that actually went home. The vast majority of them stayed living wherever they were planted. Okay? Now you go, well, what does that even mean? When the Assyrians conquered a nation, the way they kept that nation from rising up against them again was they would export them and scatter them in small groups throughout their entire kingdom. And they would be put in with groups of other conquered nations with different customs, different languages, different traditions. And that kept those people from rising up and uniting. So, okay, we're going to fight on behalf of our God. Which one? Okay? And, and so that kept those people from being able to rise up against the Assyrians. Now, this is what we call the diaspora, okay, the dispersion. Now, some people talk about the ten lost tribes of Israel. That, that's kind of a, a misnomer. They're not lost. Most of them know where they are, and God never lost track of them, okay? And he is bringing them home. The reverse of the diaspora is going on today. Israelites from all over the world are being brought home, okay? So, now, taking this number, 430 years, you subtract 70 years, God warns them throughout the book of, of Leviticus chapter 26, at least four times, he warns them that if you continue in your sin, I will add to the number of your punishment seven times. Okay, got, got the numbers? 430 minus 70 times seven. Okay? Now, that gives us a year count of 2520, 2520. But the Jews operate on a lunar calendar. We operate on a solar calendar. So now you've got to make the adjustment from a lunar calendar where everything operates on a 28-day schedule to a solar calendar where everything goes by a 365.25. Adjusting for that, the number comes up to be adding to the number from the time that they came back, 536, it puts the year at 1948. Now, God has touched this man. I'm not in sure what ways, but for somebody to sit down and figure all that out and come to that conclusion, it shows me that God knows what he's doing. Okay? When he put his word together, he put things in there that sometimes don't make sense to us. It's not because he failed, it's because we failed. Okay? So, According to Grant Jeffrey, Ezekiel 4, 3 through 6, God speaks that they will become a nation again, that this will be fulfilled, the time of their punishment will end, 1948. Okay? Ezekiel 34, 13 promises that Israel would return to their own land. Jeremiah 31, 10 promises that God would watch over his people. We're going to come back to that in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Leviticus chapter 26 verse 3 and then 7 through 8 says that Israel would be disproportionately powerful. Now I, I, I want to tie these two together. It says that God would watch over Israel and that God would cause one of them to make a hundred of their enemy flee. And ten of them would make ten thousand flee. Okay? Now Let's just look at, at three of the major conflicts that Israel has had since 1948. As a matter of fact, the day of their independence, the war for their independence started. Okay? Israel was a nation of less than a million people. It was right between eight and 900,000 people, not soldiers, people. The nations that gathered together against them, Syria, Egypt, Iran, numbered in excess of 20 million people people. And yet, Israel triumphed. Okay? 
Jumping ahead, 1967, the Six Day War. Israel pushes out and expands its boundaries, not because they're hungry for land, but to protect their people. Okay, when we were up at the Sea of Galilee, we looked across the sea and we see the, um, the, the hills of Bashan, okay? And, and the, the people over there would sit up on these mountains and they would lob mortars and cannons all the way over. It made fishing on the Sea of Galilee pretty interesting. Okay, you get a big haul of fish while you're dodging bullets. Okay? But in the Six Day War, once again, they triumphed over superior forces. Okay? Jump ahead a few more years. 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Okay? On the day of Yom Kippur, the nation of Israel is celebrating and Egypt attacks across the Suez Canal. Syria attacks in the north and on the east. And God once again, in the face of an overwhelming number of men in each army, protects Israel. Now we look at those things in the Old Testament. Okay, We look at at Hezekiah, bottled up in Jerusalem, the army has come up against them, and, and there's hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and God takes care of them. And those, those soldiers are wiped out. And we go, wow, what a miraculous thing. We're still seeing those miracles today. Okay, God has not removed his hand from Israel in its completion. He still is protecting them. He is still favoring them. Okay? Um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 3 through 5, promises the fortunes of the people of Israel would be restored. Okay? Did you know that Israel has one of the highest quality uh, of living, not just in the area. Their, their quality of living is far above the nation surrounding them. But almost, uh, they have the highest quality of living up on par with the rest of the world. Okay? So we're, we're not talking about, oh, you know, great, they, they have satellite in their tent. We're talking about medical facilities on par with anything we have here in the United States. They have been in a drought for eight years. And yet, Israel produces 20% more water than they use. Remember God's talking about streams in the desert? That God will take care of this? That He will take the desert and He will make it blossom and bloom? Amazing. Driving down to the Dead Sea. And it is dead. I mean, it, there's nothing. And there's a grove of mangoes. <laughs> <coughs> mangoes. Oh, okay. And there's a grove of date trees. And there's the, these things. Just, and there's desert all around. And yet God is bringing light into the desert. Okay, so. Ten prophecies fulfilled just in the reestablishment of Israel in 1948. Now, why did I tell you all this? Not just for your edification. I tell you this because God says in His words that He is faithful even when we are faithless. Do you believe that's true? Yes. Is God there for you even when you blow it? Why do we expect that if we think he's not going to be there for Israel when they blow? If God is faithful to us when we mess up and make mistakes, and it is the same grace from a gracious God, from a merciful God, why would we think he would not be faithful to them? Why would we think that God would just Throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, you just blew it one too many times. Because if that's the case, what's your number? What's your magic number of the times that you can mess up before God throws you out? And revokes all his promises to you. Okay? The nation of Israel, they're not serving God today. That it is one of the most agnostic nations in the world. As a matter of fact, um, The, the Jews call the Christians, there's an influx of Christians 
going to Israel, not just a tour, not just to look around and see what's there, not just to, to walk where Jesus walked, but they're going there to minister, to bring light to the Jews. They call them the Notzim. The Notzim. Okay, N-O-T-Z-R-I-M. It's the watchman. They're calling, they're calling us the watchman. Okay? We are seeing miraculous things done by God to individuals in, in Israel to bring them back to Him. Okay? Um, God has promised that for a time they're going to be lost. That's to our benefit so that we can be saved. So that we can be gathered in. But when the time of the Gentiles is over, when the gathering of the Gentiles is done, God will return to his people. Okay? You cannot read Revelation and think that God has forsaken Israel. The entire book is written about Israel. Now, I talked to you about genetic markers. I want to share just a couple things with you real quick. The nation of Israel accounts for 0.2% of all the people in the world. 0.2%. And yet that 0.2% accounts for more than 20% of the Nobel Peace Prizes awarded. Did you know that? Did you know that? More than 20% of the Nobel Prizes awarded go to that 0.2% of people in the world. God has gifted them. Let's talk about some inventions that if God had not put Jews here, we would not have. Lasers. Theodore Maimon, Albert Einstein, Zoris Alfros, all three Jews, all three responsible for the development of the first working laser. Einstein by theory, the others by application. Pacemaker, defibrillator, Jewish American, Paul Zoll. Genetic engineering, Jewish American, Paul Berg. Stainless steel, you like your stainless steel? Jewish German, Hans Goldschmidt. The mass energy equivalent, Albert Einstein. Cholera, the bubonic plague vaccines, Jewish bacteriologist, Waldemar Hofkin. Polio vaccine, Carl Landsteiner and Jonas Salk. The USB flash drives. Anybody use a USB flash drive? Yeah, developed in Israel by a company called M Systems, <coughs> working in cooperation with IBM. The first PC processor, the Intel 8088, was developed in Haifa. Instant messaging. You know, when you're sitting on your computer, Facebook, and somebody pops up and you're like, whoa. And they ask you a question, and you can type back to them and answer, and the instant messaging. You know, somebody, like my family's in Houston. And, uh, you know, it used to be that when the phone rang and I didn't want to talk, I didn't answer it. <laughs> now I'm on my computer, and they got me. I can see you're on here. <laughs> this is Thaddeus. <laughs> no. Again, another invention by an Israeli company. I'm just going to list off a number of things, okay? How about jeans, lipstick, the ballpoint pen, instant coffee, yeah, okay. <laughs> TV remote control, traffic lights, Scotch guard. Uh, how about the atom bomb, the thermonuclear bomb, genetic engineering? How about uh, Hollywood? You like movies? The majority of the people that founded Hollywood were Jews. That may not be such a good thing. Uh, long playing rock, uh, record. Woodstock. Did you know Woodstock was put on by Jewish people? I don't think they got what they were expecting. <laughs> now keep in mind, they're Jewish, not necessarily godly. Okay? Sound movies. So movies that actually have sound which I think is a cool thing. Videotape, color TV, instant photography. How about game changers like monotheism? The theory of relativity. How about the weekend? Do you realize that 
that you know the, the fact that you get days off at the end of the week came from the Jews, the Shabbat. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I've got a whole list. If you guys want to look at this, there's a Prozac. <laughs> Prozac. Some of us thank God for that. Valium, the polio vaccine. There's there's a, a whole list of these things. Okay. What I'm what I want to share with you is is that God has said the gifts and the callings are without repentance. Now, you look at Solomon, considered the wisest man to have ever lived. And, and there's, a, there's a warning that goes along with that, isn't there? Because when God came to Solomon and he said, I, I, I will give you whatever you ask. Solomon says, I, I ask that you would give me wisdom that I might rule your people in righteousness. And God says, because you did not ask for wealth, or fame. He said, I'm going to give you what you ask for, but I'm also going to give you the other things. Okay? So we go from somebody that writes the book of Proverbs that gives you brilliant insight into how to live that at the end of his life, he writes Ecclesiastes. Vain, vain. It's all vain. The uh, sitting right across um Oh, and I just forgot the name. Right across from the city of David, they call it the Hill of... Hill Castle? I'm not, no, that's the one that's south, straight across. It's the. Uh, it's where they set up all the false idols. Yeah, I can't remember. And it was there. It's floating around in the room here somewhere. <laughs> just right from where the city of David was, where Solomon would have had his palace. The hill right across, um, you, you have um, the Mount of Olives just to the left. And then there's a small hill. Sit uh, I'm sorry? Was it Kerman? No, that's way up north. Okay. They, they have a name for it that basically it, it translates to it. It's like the, the, the mountain of evil. Okay? Because that was the place where Solomon set up all the idols to his, for his wives. When he married the Egyptian, she brought her gods. And he said, okay, outside the city, we'll put it over here. When he married some of the, the women of the nation around him, and he said, okay, we'll put it over here. And, and, and it, it's right there. I mean, you have the Temple of God, the Mount of Olives, the City of David, and all these idols set up to other gods. And, and so David, who was considered the wisest of men, kind of fell into his own wisdom as a, as a trap because, he, boy, he expanded the range of his kingdom, most of it through diplomacy. Hey, you know what? I want your land. We'll marry my daughter. All right. But they brought baggage in. As a matter of fact, God told them when they came into Israel, don't marry the daughters of the people in the land that you're living. Because they will fall, they will cause you to fall to other gods. They'll, they'll lead you astray. Yet Solomon and all of his wisdom was blind to that. Okay? But God has gifted the Jewish people beyond any other race. Now you look, 0.2% of the world's population, you look at all the things that they have added, that they have blessed the world with, that God has gifted the world through them by. God is still blessing the world through them. And there is a time coming when God will say, okay, the, the full count of the Gentiles are in, and he's going to turn his eye to Israel and he's saying, now it's your turn. Okay? And they're going to come back to him. And they're going to receive, they're going to be grafted back in. That domestic branch that was cut off for a time will be grafted back into the vine, the true vine. Okay? And, and there, there will be no separation. There, there's neither Jew nor Greek. We are going to be all lovers of God. Okay? So what God has promised to them from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, He is faithful and will be faithful to complete Okay, so if you want to look at any of my notes, just let me know. You're more than welcome to look at them. Uh, you want to do, honestly, you go out to the internet and you do a search just on Israeli inventions, you're going to be floored with the, the, the stuff that they bring in. Okay, um, God is faithful. Okay, if you walk away from here with one thing, I want you to know that God is faithful. And when he says he will do something, he will do it. And when he made promises to Israel, he will fulfill those promises. When he makes promises to you, he will fulfill those promises because that is his nature. Amen? Amen. 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 Alright. Father, we bless you this morning and we thank you.
We thank you, God, that you are faithful. That when you speak a word, you speak the truth. And even if we can't see, it will come to pass because you have said so. We thank you, Father, that your hand is on the nation of Israel. And we ask, God, that you would bless them, even in their wandering. Father, that you would bless them, that you would call them home, that you would remind them, bring to their remembrance that you have established a covenant with them of old, that they are your people, and you are their God. And Father, we pray for the, the ingathering of the Gentiles. Father, the, the fields are white and the harvest. And we ask, Lord God, that laborers would be sent. Father, we ask for this fellowship, those sitting here in this building. Father, send them. Send us. Put us in the field. Show us how to work. Help us, Father, to bring in the harvest. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.